Amen. Let's uh, be in Psalm 25 if we're not there uh, already. And uh, the title of this uh, series has been a primer on trust and uh, the basics of trusting God and what that's all about and coming back to the basics. And I was kind of comparing it last week, you know, to when you learned how to read. Do you remember when you learned how to read? And, and I remember I was not a great reader, I shared with you, and I was in reading group three, you know, which I probably still would be in, I'm sure. And, and um, you know, C, Dick, Rune, she's like, that's run. Okay, run. It all seems so inconsistent to me, and I, I um, was making the point that uh, if I could go back to school, I'd pay a lot more uh, attention to those basic things. I'd get it right sooner. And uh, the same thing I think a lot of people feel like uh, in the Christian life, uh, did anyone really sit you down at the beginning and explain to you in depth that the whole thing is about trusting God? Uh, let's go back through the passage that we looked at last week and just review quickly the main things that we <clears throat> read. I just love this scripture and just never get tired of reading it. Psalm 25 verse 1 says, To you, O Lord, <coughs> I'm sorry, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. And the point that we made from there was that uh, trusting God, the act of trusting God, it's a choice. That was the first uh, thing in the primer on trusting God. Uh, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, the act of trusting God. It's a choice. And then verse 2, which the first line belongs with verse 1, O my God, in you I trust. There it is. I choose. Uh, David was running uh, for his life from his son Absalom, who was rebelling against him and trying to overthrow the throne. And rather than fight him, he said, we'll live to fight another day. And he fled Jerusalem with a, a small number of people. He was living in a cave. And he could have made a lot of choices then. But the choice that he made was the choice to trust God. And if you, uh, how could that be any more practical than where you're living right now? Just gather up in front of you two or three things that are burdening your heart, and, and I can't believe your situation is a whole lot darker than your son trying to kill you and overthrowing your throne and late in life, uh, worthless and penniless, the throne's tipped over, the crown's on the floor, and David runs for his life out of the city, and he chooses to trust God. Don't kid yourself into thinking that somehow his choice was easier than yours. Maybe his choice was even harder than the choice that you have to make. The act of trusting God, it's a choice. Verse 2, let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult or triumph over me. David was like, it can't end like this, God. Like, I think we're usually pretty good about going through hard times when we're in college and stuff like that, but surely it's not going to end like this. We kind of have the expectation that if I do what's right, that things will kind of get better over time. And so that's the issue of trusting God is, is how's it going to work out in the end? And the third thing we looked at from verse 3 was the benefit of trusting God. I think really my favorite verse in the whole passage, indeed none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Interesting. Um, that's the song that we're going to sing again at the end of the service today. No one whose hope is in you shall ever be put to shame. I love saying that. No one whose hope is in you, speaking of the Lord, will ever be put to shame. Let's say that together. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. I'm tricking you into memorizing a verse. Let's say it again. Psalm 25, 3. Say it. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Could you stand up and say it by yourself if you had to? I'm not going to make you, but could you? I don't want to say yes because you might be tricking me. I don't want to stand up. You don't have to stand up. Let's say it one last time. Psalm 25, 3. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Excellent. Say that a few times this week. Keep that right on your heart. That's the benefit of trusting God. The act, the issue, the benefit, and then the tension. Well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need some more information. I'm going to need some insight, not into the drama, but into God's character. David says, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And we pray and ask God to give us some insight, just something. Show me a card, God, something to keep me going. And then the fifth thing, the barrier to trusting God. Of course, as I draw near to God, God draws near to me. I sense his holiness. I'm aware of my sinfulness. 
Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, my foolish, um, overly confident, naive decisions. And then also, worse than my sinful youth, are my transgressions, my willful, deliberate choices to do the wrong even when I knew the right. Remember those not, God. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Leading to the last uh, thing from last week. The act, the issue, the benefit, the tension, the barrier of, to trusting God, and the humility of trusting God. Verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. All right. Six more. Twelve in total. Ready to get into it? If you're ready, just say ready. ready. I'm ready too. Let's get after this. Ready? Okay. Verse 11. Jot this down. Number seven, the impact of trusting God. The impact of trusting God. It says, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my... This is shocking that a king would say this. Pardon my guilt, for it is great. Pardon my guilt, for it is great. Uh, David was the king. Does anyone here know what it's like to be the king? I heard this line lately. Someone said, in a former life, I would think I was a king because I really like it when people do what I say. <laughs> no, no, I know there's no such thing as a former life. Settle down. It's just a joke. It's only one life. I get it. It was a joke. Do you know what it's like to be a king? Say, no, I do not. I mean, I mean... David had people lined up to shine his shoes. Everyone hoped for a chance to wax his chariot. Can I peel your grapes today? Okay, that's what it was like to be king. David did not have a lot of people contradicting him. 2 Samuel 11 says that when he sinned with Bathsheba, he saw her, he sent for her, and he took her. And nobody got in his way. All right? But see, first with Nathan and then with Absalom, God was breaking David down. God was crushing David. God was teaching David true heart humility. He was a different person than he had been. And so now, God's bringing right up to his, I mean, over a two or three year period, what happened was incredible. First, um, uh, Absalom's brother raped his sister. Soap opera. Sickening. Then David was so passive and didn't want conflict in his family so poor that he lost Absalom's respect. Now, as I said, Absalom's leading rebellion against him, trying to take over the kingdom. David's not out there in a cave going, woe is me. I'm so hard done by. And we can get like that. How many people can get like that? I can get like that. I, um, the elders know this is true. I was, I was not at a good place in the springtime. Things had happened, things, some things related to the launching of this counseling ministry. What we've been through to get to this place, you have no idea. You won't ever know, but God knows. And I'm just being honest in saying that I, I was at a place in the springtime where I was focused on what some other people needed to learn. And I was not wrong about it. And they do need to learn it. But my focus was wrong. My focus was on what other people needed to learn, not on what I needed to learn. And we're, when we're consumed with the shortcomings of others and lose sight of the person that we're supposed to be most focused on, the person in the mirror, that's not good. And so I just say that to acknowledge to you that I think that that's something that we all battle. Don't leave me up here, just nod or something. <laughs> Is that something we all kind of struggle with? And let's don't get to the place, it's not about me. Just say that to yourself, it's not about me, say that. It's not about me, and I, I need to keep my, and I'm so respect David the king here. This is the king, all right? He doesn't owe anything to anyone. And he says and publishes and writes for public worship, for your namesake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. One commentator calls this the pivotal prayer in the psalm, David's personal admission of responsibility. The word translated there, guilt, means literally to bend, to twist, uh, to distort, to pervert, to ruin. David says, my bentness, my twistedness, my distortedness, my perversion, my ruin, 
is great. And the word great there doesn't mean, he's not talking about one thing that was massive. Like, oh, you know, I was, I was awesome for years, but I made this one big mistake. He's not talking about his sin with Bathsheba here. The word translated there, great, means many and varied. My sin is great in amount. Many, many different ways I have failed repeatedly. That's what he's saying. Not one big act of failure, but many different things. For your name's sake, and, and then notice, for your name's sake. Why are you admitting this, David? You don't, you don't owe this to anyone. Why are you standing up and, and, and con- acknowledging your own shortcomings? You, you don't owe this to anyone. For your name's sake. Because it isn't about me. It's about the Lord. It's about his reputation. It's about honoring him. I love that. One of the things that we've done this summer to just strengthen our church is I asked uh, the top about 30 leaders, mostly staff, uh, to submit themselves to uh, a rigorous uh, personal examination. Uh, there was a group that helped us out of uh, Texas called the Flippin Group. And, and uh, they had this profile that they have us put through. It's actually a 360 where you have people you report to, people beside you, people under you, and you yourself do this analysis. And it is very, very intense. It's called a level three instrument. There's only three of them in the world. <laughs> when I got, got it done and I sat down with uh, the man who runs the organization, it was like a John 4 experience. It was like I met a man who told me everything I ever did. I mean, it was so deeply penetratingly accurate it was scary both in terms of your strengths and your weaknesses and it was very revealing one of the things they told me right at the outset they said the highest performers in your organization will come into the meeting and say this is awesome help me I want to be better and they said the lowest performing people in your in your organization will come in and argue with the profile. They'll say, that's not right, that's not me, I'm not sure what's wrong here, but, but something's missing, and I, I, all I'm gonna tell you is, bang, that was so on, you can't believe it. And, and incredibly, the people who need to grow the most have the most energy to argue about how they don't need to grow. It's someone else, it's somewhere else, it's something else. So that was very instructive for me, and it should be instructive for you. All right? If you're going forward, like David's going forward, if you're walking by faith, there ought to be in you a growing sense of me, I'm the one, I need to work on it, I'm not where I'm gonna be, I'm not what I could be, I'm not what I should be, but I'm gonna go forward, I'm gonna get this right, it's not too late for me, all right? That humility, that teachability, the impact of trusting God, listen to me, is that it changes you. When you lay your life down uh, before someone, when you say, I'm not driving the car, God is. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to obey him. When you do that, all right, that is a life-changing decision. Every day of God driving in me trusting is a day of learning and growing and changing. That's the impact. (laughs) Even the king was getting that. Are you getting it? Here's number eight. The impact of trusting God. Now the motive of trusting God. The motive. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. The fear. See it there? Circle that in your Bible. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Fear. Here's a definition. What does that mean to fear God? What's that mean to fear God? Well, um, how many people have heard it said that, that it means uh, to respect God? Put up your hand if you've heard that. Okay, that is very bad teaching, okay? So just put that out of your mind. Oh, it means to respect God. It means, it means to hold him in awe. Where did that come from, all right? Hundreds of times in the Bible it's translated F-E-A-R. So I was working on that this week, trying to come up with a word to help you understand what it means to fear God. Knowing me as you do, want to take a guess at what it means? Fear. Yeah, it means to fear him. That's the best I could come up with. All right? That, that, that we're to fear God. Do you remember the two thieves on the cross? The one who repented and the one who didn't? And the one who didn't yelled out at the other one who was cursing Jesus and said, don't you, he said, we're here for what we've done. Don't you even fear God? As the most basic kind of characteristic of faith. Jot this definition down. Here's what it means. 
Fear is the attitude of heart that seeks to be in a right relationship with the fear source. That's what fear is. If you fear God, you want to be in a right relationship with him. Fear is the attitude of heart that wants to be in a right relationship with the fear source. <clears throat> if I fear the future, I save. <laughs> I work. I um, uh, try to be responsible. I don't want to be penniless when I'm old, so I'm, I'm doing the best I can to prepare because I fear the future. In the right sense of the word, that's a healthy thing. If I fear uh, the dentist, let's talk about the dentist for a minute. If I fear the dentist, um, <coughs> I floss. Because I, because I hate when I get there, and he makes that self-righteous speech about, you haven't been flossing. How many of you have had that speech? Right. Well, the reason I'm not flossing is because I hate it. <laughs> but of late, what I hate more is that speech you just gave me. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to start. If I <clears throat> Fear is the attitude of heart that seeks a right relationship with the fear source. If I don't want that speech from the dentist, I'm going to brush on the gum line for two minutes and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to floss. If I fear God... If I fear the future, I prepare. If I fear the dentist, I brush. If I fear God, I submit. I give him the wheel. I do what he says. I want to be in a right relationship with the fear source. So, like I didn't have enough trials in my life, God knows, back in uh, May, I had my first kidney stone. <coughs> Not great. Uh, uh, Kathy was taking care of uh, our little grandbaby Carter because uh, Kristen was just finishing up out here at HCA. And uh, so we had Carter with us and we, it was a Monday, we were out for breakfast and uh, it was um, the day after I preached my last, first day of my sabbatical. <laughs> and and uh, so we were at Egg Harbor, this restaurant in downtown Arlington Heights and everything was good. And then I, I, all of a sudden I was just like, oh, that was a little pinch. <laughs> Wondering what that was, a little muscles thing or something. And I'm not kidding, within one minute, I was like, oh! <laughs> and then like one, I was like moving around and, and I still, I'd never had one of these. All my brothers have had them, my dad's had one, I've never had one. About a minute later, I, I stood up and said, I gotta go outside. And I was outside in front of this restaurant. What on earth is this hurting a lot? Until about a minute later when I walked into the restaurant. No, I did not go over to the table. I stood at the door and said, get Carter, we got to go. <laughs> Kathy grabs the baby, brings him out, puts him in the car seat. I'm, I'm in the car, I'm like, drive, drive, we got to go to the hospital. This was hurting so bad. On the way to the hospital, one more minute later, I'm like, forget the stop signs, just get there. <coughs> Carter was crying in the back seat, screaming, <coughs> which I'm sure was somewhat related to me. <coughs> we get to the hospital. Has anyone here ever been to Northwestern Community Hospital? Man, that place has had way too many additions. It is so confusing. I'm like, where's the emergency room? They have hidden that back inside a corridor. I jump out of the car, run into the lobby and said, I, I'm in pain. And they're like, uh, sir, the emergency. I had to go back out the door, walk all the way around the parking garage. When I got in the front door there, I said, I'm in pain. <laughs> the lady says, sir, you'll have to fill out these forms. <laughs> I said, give me the pen. I'll stab myself in the neck. <laughs> It was crazy, I'm telling you. So anyway, my first experience with kidney stones. So I finally passed the kidney stone and everything and it all calmed down and they said, um, you know, to flush out your system, they said you should now, you should drink cranberry juice every day. Yeah, I, 
hate cranberry juice. In fact, I'd have to fall a long way from where I am about cranberry juice to get to hate. I mean, I hate it. A question, am I drinking cranberry juice every day? Yes, why? Because fear is the attitude of heart that seeks a right relationship to the fear source. I do not, I do not want to go through that again. And so I'm going to do what I can. Now let me just ask you. Have you ever been on the wrong side of God? Have you ever felt the sting of disobedience? Have you ever felt the consequential crushing of the wrong choices you've made? Well, if that is having the effect that God desires it to have, then you now fear God. You want to be in a right place with the fear source, and nothing is more important than that. If I have to drink the cranberry juice, I'll drink it. Whatever I have to do to be in a right relationship so I don't have to experience that again, that's what I'm willing to do. Let me give you a little overview of this concept in Scripture. It's so important. We are commanded to fear the Lord. Deuteronomy 10, 20 says, you shall fear the Lord your God. We're told that it's the beginning of wisdom. Psalm 111, verse 10, and many other places say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's a matter of choice to fear the Lord. It's not a feeling. Proverbs 129 says they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. You can learn how to fear the Lord. Deuteronomy 14, 23 says that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. It causes us to hate what God hates. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. It keeps a person from sinning. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. Get this, it prolongs your life. Proverbs 10, 27 says, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. All the stress and anxiety and bitterness and weight of choosing the wrong, listen to me, it's killing you. And it brings a reward, Proverbs 22, 4, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. It's a good thing. And here in the text, who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. That's fantastic. Look at verse 13. The consequence of fearing the Lord, his soul shall abide in well-being. That's a great promise, well-being. This is, of course, uh, NIV uh, and New King James say a prosperity. It's the idea of value, quality, well-being. Psalm 34, 10 says, those who fear the Lord lack no good thing. Then notice the end of verse 13, and his offspring shall inherit the land. Look, fearing the Lord gives you a place. It gives you a place. You have a place. Do you have a place? Uh, last Sunday after church, I wanted so much to see my mom again. I jumped on my uh, motorcycle and rode to Detroit uh, Sunday night. I was very tired, stayed over with a friend. Then I went uh, about 100 miles more, saw her, uh, surprised, walked up to the front door Monday morning uh, with my helmet on. She was freaking out <laughs> until I took it off. Then she was very happy. And uh, I spent 24 hours just with my mom and dad, had a great time with them. And one of the things that I did was there, I, I got on my motorcycle and I rode around in the neighborhood where I grew up. First 20 years of my life, went around the elementary school I went to, went around the high school that I went to. So much of my life is tied up in that place. But then I got on the motorcycle the next morning and drove all the way back here to Chicago. And now I just feel so strongly, this is my place. I, ha I have a place and, and I hope that you have that sense in your life that you're putting down roots deeply and that you have your place. That's what he means when he says that he had his place. He uh, shall abide in well-being and his children will have a place. They shall inherit the land. And that's the motive for trusting God is that we fear him and those good things come to us. And now the intimacy of trusting God, verse 14. Just learning, there's a primer on trust. Let's learn about how this affects our relationship with God. Verse 14, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes them to know his covenant. What? 
the friendship of the Lord is wisdom. So which is it? Because <clears throat> I'm sure you wouldn't say, James, that you have a friendship relationship with kidney stones. So which is it? Do you fear God or do you have a friendship with him? Actually, the word translated there, friendship, in some translations, um, how many people have the word secret there? All right, well, it's, it's, you can see why the Hebrew has translated it differently. What the, what the uh, term actually means is a confidential counsel. The kind of counsel that you would share with a confidant, someone that you've come to trust. It's personal, uh, treasured communication, the kind that would be shared between close friends. And so that's why some translations have a friendship. Um, the point is, is that there's an intimacy with God uh, where he's disclosing his secrets to me. There's a close familial relation. You say, well, James, how does that square with a fear? Here's, here's how it squares. Uh, 1 John 4, 8, 18 says that perfect love casts out fear. All right? Perfect love casts out fear. So let me just come up here and emphasize this part. Um, this is really, really important. I'm not living today in a fear relationship with God. That's my foundation, but that's not where I am. Uh, 1 John 4 says that he who is perfected in love does not need to fear. Fear's where I started in my relationship with God. I didn't want to go to hell. He's holy. I'm not. But, but you grow up into a love relationship with God. That's not where you start, but that's what you grow up into. But I'm really thankful that I have the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. I'm glad that I have fear as my foundation with God. So that if I leave church today and I decide to go live like a selfish moron and do stu something stupid by midnight to devastate a lot of people, I, I won't do that by God's grace. Why? Because I fear God. Why do I make some of the hard decisions I make? Why do I make some of the difficult follow through? I'm going to stay committed even when it's hard. It was interesting to hear Ted Kennedy say, uh, we persevere because we have no choice. All right? And, and that was a great statement. That the, that the foundation of life is, is I, I do what I have to do because I fear the consequences of not doing it. However, um, we grow up into a love relationship. By the way, uh, extrapolate that into your parent philosophy, by the way. Parents who are trying to build their foundation of parenting on a love relationship are undercutting the very thing that they want. Start with fear. My dad used to say as a school teacher, they hate you in the fall, they respect you in the winter, and they love you in the spring. If, if you try to get that reversed, you're, God's not doing that with you, that's all I can tell you. He starts, I'm God, you're not, do what I say. And then when you start getting that right and you learn and understand his ways, you see how loving that really was of him to draw the lines. There's such safety and protection in that. And so we grow up into an intimate relationship with God. So I was out with my parents. <laughs> my dad was a disciplinarian, uh, big time. Uh, wait till your father gets home meant something at our house. And it was interesting. I was out for dinner with my parents, and, and uh, we laughed together, and we cried together, and we prayed together. And, um, but then in one part, we had kind of a difficult conversation about something, and um, I chose my words carefully. He's my dad. And, and that's not wrong. Now I have this amazing loving friendship with my parents, but still there's that foundation there. And that's the way it needs to be between us and God. And that's what he means when he says the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. You get the friendship part when you start with the fear part. Is that clear? Okay, and that's the way it has to be. And that's the way God wants it to be. And that's what the intimacy is all about. He makes known to them his covenant. God discloses his best things to the people who fear him and build an intimacy with him through trust. All right, turn the page. Three more, quickly. The focus of trusting God. Now the focus, what, what's, what's the focus? What, what, if I'm gonna walk in trust, man, my mind wanders and wallows and, and I have so many questions going through my mind. Here's the focus. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. For he will pluck my feet out of the net. The word ever there means you could even, some translations have continually. It's the idea of continuity, like a dripping faucet. It never stops. My eyes are continually toward the Lord. All right? 
continually, continually, continually. There's never a time when I'm not turning, it's on, my eyes are on God. When my eyes are on my circumstances, not great. My expectations, when, when I, have, I have my expectations. I have some things I thought my kids were gonna do for me. I have some things I thought my spouse was gonna do for me. If my eyes are on my expectations, not good. My eyes are on the Lord, not on my wisdom, not on my network. I got some people I can call, they'll take care of this. Not on my investments, for sure. Not on my resume. Hey, I'll always be able to get a job. I've done some things. I'll just go out and shop myself. I can do better. Well, that's good for you. But is that where your hope is? Not on my ability to persuade. Psalm 121 says, I look to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Where are you looking for the answer you need? You're going to take matters into your own hands? You're going to settle this yourself? Like Peter walking on the water, the moment we take our eyes off the Lord, we begin to sink. I wrote down just quickly five other places we're tempted to look other than to the Lord. Number one, to people. I have my girlfriend. I call my girlfriend on the phone. And, and, and hey, be careful you're not giving relational equity to pe other people that belongs in your marriage. All right? Make sure you're not doing that. Make sure you're not. It's fine to have friends. Friends are great. Friends are biblical. Friends are wonderful. But give your best energy to the relationship that has to last a lifetime. Not looking to other people. Not looking to circumstances. I'm just sort of, you know, it's going to change. When this happens, when this happens, when the kids get home from college, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the, when they're off to school, when looking to circumstances. Looking to people, looking to circumstances, looking to personal strength. I'll get through this. I'll get through this. That's a surefire remedy to be hard and bitter in your retirement, is gutting it out. People, circumstances, personal strength. Some people look to time. It's going to work out. It won't always be like this. I'm just going to leave it alone. I'm not going to do anything. Time, 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 time. I had a conversation with someone this week. Time's not fixing this. Fix it. It has to get fixed. Time is not going to do it. And then some people trust in truisms. I'm sorry, but this always makes me smile. People are like, well, like, what's your plan exactly? They're like, well, um, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. I'm like, for real? That's your whole thing? He says, no, I have something else too. What goes around, comes around. <laughs> for real? That's your whole life? You should come to church, man. There's more. And, and, uh, but some people, they just have a couple little things there just counting on. And David said, my eyes are ever toward the Lord. He will pluck my feet out of the net. And back in the biblical times and in some places in the world still, they had to hunt to eat. And they would dig a, a shallow hole and cover it and camouflage it, put a net across it, and then some branches, and an animal would run along, fall into the hole, but the reason it wouldn't run out of the hole again is because it would get caught up in the net. A, a total sense of helplessness, the more they fight. And David, in this cave outside of Jerusalem, felt like, I'm trapped, I can't get out of this myself. What an important moment of admission. Maybe that's really why you came to church today. Maybe you just need to admit, I'm trapped. I cannot get out of this myself. But my eyes are ever toward the Lord. He will pluck my feet out of the net. That's the focus of trusting God. And now uh, the prayer of trusting God. I'm gonna commend to you Proverbs 25, verses 16 through 21 for your quiet time this week, all right? So you planning on spending some time with the Lord this week? Are you? Good, excellent. I want you to spend some time, I'm gonna just encourage you in this direction, spend some time in Proverbs 25, 16 through 21. Let's call this the prayer of trusting God. All right, it's a prayer. He prays a prayer actually in the <clears throat> next few verses, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. One, two, three, four, five, six verses. 11 times he petitions God in these verses. We can learn a lot about prayer. If you struggle sometimes with the content of your prayer, do you ever want to pray but you don't know what to say? Does that ever happen to you? Not sure exactly what to say. Well, this will help. Let me just walk through the verses and I'll point out these six things to you. Notice, first of all, honesty. 
He says, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. You can say that to God. You can say to God, I'm lonely. I mean, I mean who says that? Do you ever say that to people? Hey, I just wanted you to know I'm lonely. That's kind of like social suicide, right? He's like, hey, I'm lonely. Will you be my friend? <laughs> and people are like, whoa, that is so weird, man. What's your name? No, forget. Don't tell me. Do not tell me. <laughs> and, and you don't say that. But you, listen, you can say that to God, can't you? You can say that. Here, stand up for a second. You can say that to God. You can come to the Lord and you can tell him, listen, how you really feel. He can handle it. You can tell God that you're lonely. You can say, Lord, I just don't have the relationships that I need. He's the friend who sticks closer than a brother, all right? You can open your heart to him. That's a good first step, honesty in prayer. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I'm lonely and afflicted. And then, jot this down, petition. It's so simple. Tell God what you need. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Bring me out, God. I'm ready for this to be over. By Friday. Okay, God, listen, this is the last week, all right? Enough. Now, will God always answer the way you want him to? No, sometimes we're, because it's like your kids, right? We, I don't know why we don't just ask God for stuff. We were always so worried, well, what if he says no? That never bothered my kids. Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? No, 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 no. Next day, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? Right, that's what kids are like. We should be like children with God. Sometimes he'll say yes. Sometimes he will say no. Sometimes he'll say wait. I don't know what he'll say. But don't let that keep you from asking. Tell the Lord what you need. You have not because you ask not, James said. Honesty, petition, confession. Right in the middle of my prayer. Deal with your own sin. You say, yeah, that's kind of why I haven't been praying. Right. Deal with your own sin. David says it again. Consider, pardon me, um, verse 18. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. That's so important. Verse 19. Tell God what's happening. Verse 19. Honesty, petition, confession, description of circumstance. Tell God what's happening. He says, consider how many are my foes. <laughs> That's a really funny thing to say to God. Lord, if you could check the roster of the other team, there's a lot of people against me right now. Consider, count, Lord, can we just take a second and just sort of count up how many people are with me? Because I don't know if you've noticed, a lot are going over to Absalom. He's got a lot of people on his side, and I'm trusting you, and I know you're bigger than all of that. Remember David, Saul killed his thousands, David killed his 10,000, so he knew that me, him and God was always majority. But he was like, can we just kind of just do a little accounting here? Because it's not looking great right now. Consider how many are my foes, oh, and I love this, and with what violent hatred they hate me. NIV says, how fiercely. God, these people aren't just in a bad mood, God. They, they want to kill me. They have very sharp sticks, God, and they're headed this way. This is real. This really happened. So easy to see why he said what he said. He's describing the circumstance to God. Now, it's a great thing for you to do in your prayers. Tell God what, what's happening. Of course, then your mind goes, but, <laughs> but he already knows what's happening. That's okay. Tell him anyway. Just tell him. Why? Well, not because he needs to know, but because you need to know he knows. And in the process of unburdening your heart, just tell God, and then she said, and I just feel like, and why can't it be, and, and are, do you see this, and what should I do? And, and just tell God what's happening. That is a huge part of prayer. So when you're in your prayer time this week, can we work on that? Let, let's, let's tell God what's happening, like David's doing. Honesty, petition, confession, description of circumstance. Two more, faith, faith. O oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. Express faith to God. You're going to work this out, God. You're going to work this out. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame and, and express faith to God. Now look up here for a minute. I can't tell you why this is, but I've learned this in my life. When my faith is weak, 
and I begin to speak out words of faith, I can feel that invigorating my soul. Don't say what you feel. Don't say what you think. All right? Speak out words of faith. I take refuge in you. I'm trusting in you, God. I'm, my hope is in you. I'm waiting on you. Speak out words of faith to God. I'm telling you, you'll be at a better place when you get up off your knees than you were when you kneed, kneeled down. Faith, and then finally, dedication. Make a commitment to God. May integrity and uprightness preserve me. David there is not talking about who he is, but who he's determined to be. Let my commitment to doing what is right in the fear of the Lord preserve me. Maintain me, God. I'm not going to lose it. I'm not going to melt down. I can go on. I'm committed to you. Pray honesty, petition, confession, description of circumstance, faith, and dedication. Pray those things. The prayer of trusting God. And lastly, the conclusion of trusting God. Notice the conclusion. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. Now look up here for a minute. Don't pack up nothing. Final paragraph. Isn't it interesting that David, at the end of this primer on trust, it's been about his own relationship with God, but to what end? Because he was carrying a very heavy burden for the nation of Israel. Isn't it interesting that he says, redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Fix me, God, not as an end in itself, but get me to a better place because of the responsibility that I have to others. I want you to know that I relate to that greatly. The reason why I persevere, the reason why I keep going, I just wrote in my own Bible there, Redeem Harvest Bible Chapel, O God, out of all his troubles. We are not everything that we're going to be. But I, Kathy and I are so committed to persevering in faith for our sakes, for your sakes, for our sakes. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this uh, conclusion. Thank you that what we commit ourselves to, we do not do so separately, but we do it together. Thank you that we are not walking this road alone, and though my trial is different than his or hers, our eyes are upon the same one. Be gracious to us, Father, today. Help us to persevere in this life of faith. Our eyes are upon you. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you, O oh God, I put my trust. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. Let's sing that to the Lord.